afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on health, wellbeing and sport. Question number one, Mary Scanlon. To ask the Scottish Government what is being done to ensure early diagnosis and appropriate ongoing support for mental health patients. Minister Jamie Hepburn. NHS boards and their partners work together to ensure all those who need access to mental health services can do so quickly and efficiently in line with their statutory duties and Scottish Government policy. We are making progress in delivering the commitments in the National Mental Health Dementia and Suicide Prevention Strategies which support early diagnosis and faster access to treatment, for example, in setting waiting time targets for psychological therapies in children and adolescent mental health services and improving post-diagnosis support for people with dementia. Lady Scanlon. You, given that 30 per cent of GP consultations are mental health related and that GPs have minimal, if any, training in mental health, how can patients be assured that they get the right diagnosis and appropriate referral to specialists? And what is the government doing to ensure that GPs are given the support and training to diagnose and advise 30 per cent of their patients? Minister. Well, far be it from me to second-guess the clinical judgment of our fully qualified medical professionals. I think we should uh, recognise that uh, GPs are uh, provided with uh, substantial training uh, and, uh, in the terms of the expertise across uh, the uh, range of uh, health services they have to deliver. Uh, we will always be keen to uh, do uh, more to support, particularly in relation to uh, mental health services. There is a range of activity uh, already happening out there, and we are always willing to hear uh, new innovative ideas. Many thanks. Question number two, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask Scottish Government what funding is available for minority sports. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Sports Scotland, the National Agency for Sport, invests Scottish Government and National Lottery funding and recognised Scottish governing bodies of sport. In addition, Sports Scotland invests Scottish Government lottery funds through a range of programmes available to charitable trusts, youth organisations and voluntary sports clubs covering a wide range of sports and sporting activities. Rob Gibson. I thank the Minister for his evidence. I'd like to focus on kickboxing for a moment. Uh, young Ewan Glineski uh, won the uh, under-12 British Championship in the, the Quan Open uh, last September. And when you go to the international level, it takes a lot of expense to support this. And I'm wondering what Sports Scotland is going to do for ensuring that Scottish participants in this worldwide sport can see a lot more Scottish youngsters getting the support they require. Minister. Uh, I thank Rob Gibson for uh, the supplementary question. Uh, let me first of all congratulate Mr Gibson's constituent on uh, his achievements. And I'm always very keen that we do what we can. It's what a wide range of sporting opportunities. I did say in my initial uh, answer, uh, President Officer, that uh, much of the funding is channeled through uh, recognised Scottish governing bodies of sport. It is actually the case at the moment that kickboxing is not uh, an activity uh, that has a, a, a recognised governing uh, body. Uh, there is, of course, uh, a mechanism for uh, such organisations to become uh, recognised by Sports Scotland, and details are available on the Sports Scotland uh, website. Of course, I did mention the other uh, range of uh, funding uh, me mechanisms which could be used to uh, better support uh, kickboxing. Uh, if Mr Gibson wants to uh, contact me uh, further about the specific uh, issue of kickboxing, I would be very happy uh, to get back to him with further details. Thank you, Minister. Supplementary from Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Minister will be aware that Sports Scotland uh, put very exacting demands on sports pitches that are designated by them as such. He will be aware that shinty sports pitches are being asked um, to maintain, shinty sports clubs are being asked to maintain their pitches at huge expense, al almost making them unviable. Will he look at how Sports Scotland uh, ask those, those uh, clubs to maintain their pitches, but also look at finance for clubs so that they can maintain those pitches and indeed bring shinty out to the wild, wider world? Minister. Well, I, very much the same as my answer to Mr Gibson. There is, of course, those other uh, areas of funding that individual clubs could potentially apply to. I'd be very happy to <laughs> explore the specific point that uh, Rodi Grant has raised with uh, Sports Scotland. So I commit uh, to doing that and I can refer uh, back to uh, Ms Grant with uh, an update. I would observe, though, I think it's absolutely right uh, that Sports Scotland do uh, uh, ask uh, for uh, uh, commi certain commitments from uh, governing bodies and sports organisations they invest in, because after all it is uh, public funds. But I think the points that Ms Grant are well made, and I'll uh, undertake to look further into them. Thank you, Minister. Question number three, Kevin Stewart. The presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made with the development of the new Aberdeen Women's Hospital and Cancer Care Centre. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. 
work on the 120 million new facilities now, the Baird Family Hospital and the Anchor Centre at the Forster Hill site in Aberdeen is progressing well. A governance structure to oversee the project has been established and NHS Grampian has committed resources to support the successful delivery of the project with key posts now filled or in the process of being filled. Work is in progress to put in place the key advisors needed to support the project. The clinical brief is being developed and is nearly complete. The process has um, involved over 200 staff and public representatives. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Uh, the investment in these facilities and the extra £49.1 million this year for NHS Grampian is very welcome. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if NHS Grampian has started on its workforce planning strategy to ensure that when these new facilities open, they do so with the right complement of staff? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm certainly pleased that, that Kevin Stewart has uh, welcomed the additional £49.1 million for NHS uh, Grampian uh, this financial year. Um, in answer to the, the question on workforce planning, uh, work to develop the clinical brief for the new facilities now nearing completion. The emerging clinical brief will be discussed at the project board in May. Uh, once the service brief has been agreed in principle, work to undertake the service redesign associated with preparing for these new facilities can begin. And this will include the production of comprehensive workforce models to meet the agreed treatment pathways within the revenue budget available to NHS Grampian. Thank you. Question number four, Paul Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what podiatry services are available to older people in Glasgow who cannot afford uh, private treatment. Minister Maureen Watt. Clinical podiatry services are available free at the point of need to people of all ages who have a clinical or medical need for podiatry care. These services are provided by highly trained registered professionals in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde who assess, diagnose and treat abnormalities and diseases of the foot and lower limb. Paul Martin. Uh, in 2013, the Scottish Government submitted guidance to health boards advising them that free Personal foot, advising them that, that personal foot care is not the responsibility of NHS Scotland. Uh, can the Minister advise me why this decision was taken and what should my constituents do who those who can't afford uh, the free private treatment they've been referred to? Minister. Well, personal care is available without charge for everyone in Scotland aged 65 and over who have been assessed by the local authority as needing it. The legislation includes keeping fingernails and toenails trimmed as one of the, high, of the personal hygiene aspects of personal care. Family members and or carers can be taught to provide personal, uh, personal foot care as part of the personal care plan uh, or a personal independence payment is designed to assist patients and clients with personal care costs. Uh, they can apply for financial assistance and individuals need to go through the DWP or their local council. Thank you. Question number five, John Pentland. To ask the Scottish Government how many NHS chief exec executives were awarded performance-based pay progression of more than 1% based on performance in the years 2014-15? Cabinet Secretary. Performance in 2014-15 determines pay for 2015-16 Awards have not yet been made since the appraisal process has only just begun. In any case, details of individual pay awards are not held centrally. John Pentland. Well, given that uh, answer, I think it would be quite disappointing and alarming that you know, the pay awards for chief executives is not known to the, the public uh, as to how well chief executives are performing. And I also believe that perhaps the frontline staff who are only entitled to a 1% increase would have that right to know. Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, of course, Scotland is the only part of the United Kingdom where all NHS staff have received 1% increases to cover cost of living rises in 2014-15 and 15-16. Uh, in addition, staff are eligible for progression increases. In the case of chief executives, the uh, percentage increase is determined by their performance and ranges from zero to 3%. In comparison, a band 5 nurse could expect progression from just under 3% to over 4%. No member of staff receives progression when they reach the top of their scale. Thank you. Question number six, Alex Ferguson. 
Um, to ask the Scottish Government um, what discussions it's had with NHS Dumfries and Galloway regarding future GP provision. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is committed to developing a national GMS contract in Scotland which will sustain and support general practice for the future. Scottish Government officials are currently undertaking a series of meetings with all health boards and a large number of local area medical committees involving GPs conducted jointly with BMA Scotland to learn and collate evidence to inform the future direction. The meeting with Dumfries and Galloway Health Board took place on Tuesday the 3rd of February. Thank you. Alex Ferguson. Well, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response, but as she'll be aware, some 20% of Scotland's GP workforce is now over 55. Uh, and likely to retire in five to ten years' time. And in my own constituency of Dumfries and Galloway, and indeed in the health board area, uh, that, is a, uh, that situation is much worse. On top of that, the Office of National, National Statistics recently estimated that the lowest population growth for Scotland by 2020 would be 123,000, which would require a further 536 GPs if the 2009 doctor-patient ratio was to be maintained. Now, we have an expanding population, requirement for more GPs, an increasing number of GPs likely to retire in the very near future. So what is the Scottish Government doing to make sure that we have the estimated between estimated six and 900 new GPs by 2020? Cabinet Secretary. Well, firstly, um, can, I, can I say to Alex Ferguson that uh, GP numbers have increased um, up by 7% and uh, that has seen a, a, an increase in GP services of around £70 million under this government. But, you know, I think Alex Ferguson does <coughs> make an a, a not unreasonable point that we need to plan for the future. Uh, we are, as I said in my initial answer, in discussions with um, not just the BMA, the Royal College of, of, of GPs and others, to look at uh, the future model of primary care, because I think it's fair to say that we need to look at the wider primary care team and the role of the GP within that. There is an opportunity, as I'm sure he'll be aware, for the first ever Scottish-only contract, which will uh, begin in 2017, to look at perhaps doing things in a bit of a different way. So we are in discussion at the moment. However, meantime, he'll be aware that we have made adjustments to the existing contract to reduce bureaucracy and to help GPs to manage their workload uh, more effectively. We are looking to support the recruitment of GPs. Uh, we have, uh, of course, the option of salaried GPs, where that is a requirement, where, uh, where there is a, a difficulty in recruiting to certain areas. Uh, and, of course, we'll be very closely looking at the workforce requirements uh, as we get to the autumn when we would be looking at uh, GP numbers going forward. So uh, there, there is more work to be done, and I'll be the first to acknowledge that. But I think we also have to acknowledge the work that's already been carried out and uh, the number of GPs that uh, have expanded under this government. Thank you. Question number seven, Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. In a similar vein, to ask the Scottish Government what action it takes to help NHS boards to maintain GP numbers. Cabinet Secretary. Well, under this government, the number of GPs employed in Scotland has risen by 6.9 per cent to nearly 5,000, the highest ever on record. We have also increased funding by 10 per cent, and there are more GPs per head of population in Scotland uh, than uh, in England. This government will continue to go on supporting and sustaining Scottish general practice. For example, the recently agreed GP contract aims to give the profession stability over the next three years, reducing bureaucracy and allowing doctors to spend more time with patients. And we'll continue to work with the RCGP, the BMA and others to find innovative solutions to GP recruitment and retention challenges. Angus MacDonald. Thank you. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the recent challenges at uh, Grangemouth's recently amalgamated Kersey Bank medical practice, where we've seen an exodus of five GPs in the space of four months. Uh, thankfully, NHS Forth Valley has turned a short-term crisis into an opportunity by taking over the management of the practice this week and creating a new community-based practice. Given that this is a UK-wide problem, not just Forth Valley or Scotland, and that the GP workforce has fundamentally changed over recent years, uh, and acknowledging the, the response to Alex Ferguson's question, uh, what more can the Cabinet Secretary and the Scottish Government do to address the recruitment problems facing the GP service? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> First of all, just a little bit more on workforce planning. And although um, it is the responsibility of NHS boards, support is provided to them in the, the form of periodic workforce surveys, which is conducted by the Scottish Government across 
general practice. And the next one will be undertaken in the autumn of this year. And boards also conduct their own surveys from time to time. And that will give us a, a clearer, more comprehensive picture of some of the, the challenges uh, uh, in certain areas, as Angus Macdonald has uh, mentioned, particularly in his own patch. Uh, we are continuing to develop a range of initiatives to recruit and support GPs working in general practice and we recognise there's more uh, to do to improve the situation as I said to Alex Ferguson that's why we are working with the BME and the profession to achieve this and I'm very happy to keep uh, Angus Macdonald and Alex Ferguson updated as to the uh, the outcome of those discussions. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, Malcolm Chisholm. Um, can I tell the Cabinet Secretary about the Leith Links medical practice in my constituency, where three GPs have left recently and um, the um, practice has been unable to recruit any uh, uh, GPs to replace them. As a result, 2,000 patients have been told that they must leave uh, this particular practice, and clearly this is causing great concern in my constituency. I hear what the Cabinet Secretary is uh, saying about a range of measures, but does she real realise the urgency of this situation, and has she had any discussions with NHS Lothian about it? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm certainly uh, happy to have a discussion with NHS Lothian and uh, I can certainly get back to Malcolm Chisholm about that. I mean, where uh, there, there is a difficulty with uh, GP provision, uh, the health board uh, can uh, sometimes assist with that in terms of uh, potentially a salary service or indeed helping uh, the practice to recruit uh, uh, GPs to, to that practice. I mean, there have been some uh, recent uh, changes to pension arrangements, which I think has unfortunately in some cases perhaps speeded up the early retirement of, of some GPs, and that is to be uh, regretted. So I am certainly happy to speak to NHS Lothian and get back to Malcolm Chisholm uh, with more information. Thank you, Nanette Milne. You. Um, I appreciate, um, as the Cabinet Secretary said in her response to Alex Ferguson, that the number of GPs in Scotland have gone up. But in planning for the future, how much weight is being given to the fact that a large number of GPs nowadays, both male and female, um, are actually only working part-time in general practice? Cabinet Secretary. I think Lynette Milne hits upon an important point, that when you speak to young doctors who are making the decision about which area of um, uh, medicine to specialise in, Many of those young doctors are uh, put off general practice because they don't want to necessarily become involved in the management of a practice with all of the accountancy and staff management that that entails. They simply want to operate in general practice. And I think we have to think about that. We have to think about how we can make uh, general practice more flexible. And these are all of the issues that we want to and are discussing with the Royal College, uh, the BMA and others, so that the, the model of primary care that we uh, can develop going forward particularly with the opportunity of the new contract for 2017 takes account of all of these issues and makes general practice a more attractive proposition because if we don't do that then young doctors making their choices are, are not going to come into general practice in the numbers that we need them to. Jenny Mara. <clears throat> Would the uh, Cabinet Secretary share my concerns about the increasing prevalence of locum uh, GPs who, who come in to a practice, don't know the patient's history, uh, don't know perhaps their, their family history and the community that, that, that can impact their health? And does she share my concerns on the increasing prevalence of locums and what is she doing to specifically get more salaried uh, GPs so we don't have to rely on locum GPs? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course... General practice and primary care is in the main still delivered through independent contractors. That has been the model uh, for, for decades, really, since the National Health Service was established. Um, however, there has been an increasing number of salary GPs that have uh, come into post, particularly to deliver uh, some uh, services, for example, in areas of deprivation. And um, I met with uh, some excellent salary GPs in the Wester Hills uh, Living Centre Centre, which uh, is a, a fantastic centre running a number of services. Uh, so salary GPs do have an important role uh, to play, uh, but we have to make sure, I think, that we create a, a mixed model because it would be very uh, difficult to um, go from a, a system that is based around independent contractors to a fully salaried model. Um, I think that would, that would be very, very challenging indeed. So I think a mixed model is the way uh, forward. In terms of the issue of locum GPs, 
I mean, locum GPs have been around for a long time because they quite often come in and fill for maternity leave or sick leave, and they have a, a role to play. I think, though, uh, we absolutely need to make sure, whether it's locum GPs or, or locums in any other uh, speciality of medicine, that where possible uh, we uh, ensure that we can recruit to uh, permanent positions. And health boards, of course, have been trying to do that, but that's not always easy particularly in some specialities and in some locations. And that's why locums are used, because at the end of the day, what's important is that patients have a service and have someone who is providing that service. And if that can only be a locum meantime until recruitment can take place, then that is better than having no service at all. Thank you. Question number eight, Colin Beattie. To ask the Scottish Government what initiatives it has to support community-based sporting groups over the coming year. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Sports Scotland, the National Agency for Sport, recognises the contribution which community-based community -based clubs make to the development of a world-class system for sport in Scotland. Sports Scotland's Help for Clubs website provides information on funding sources and a wide range of other guidance to support sports clubs. Colin Beattie. The Minister may be aware of the Musselburgh Monarchs, a BMX biking group in my constituency. Given the recent resurgence of BMX biking throughout the rest of the UK, but considering there are only two other clubs in Scotland, can the Minister confirm what the Scottish Government will be doing to promote the sport and to help improve its popularity? Jamie Hepburn. Uh, let me thank uh, Mr Beattie for uh, the question at the outset. Uh, I am very happy to set out uh, the Government's support for cycling generally, and uh, I would point out, President Officer, that Sports Scotland invested £1.6 million in uh, the national governing body for cycling from 2013 to 2015, and also my support for BMX biking specifically. Uh, indeed, I have very recently visited Cumbernauld Centurion's BMX uh, club in my own uh, constituency. I am also uh, very pleased to say that with support of the uh, Scottish Government, Sports Scotland and Scottish Cycling, there has been a considerable amount of activity uh, underway to promote cycling and BMX biking, in particular through the likes of 2014 Active Places Fund. We were able to fund a new track at Broadwood Stadium in my own area uh, in advance of the 2018 European Sports Championships. There will be a new BMX track in Glasgow and a number of community sports hubs now offer BMX uh, as an activity providing opportunities for riders uh, and raising the profile of sport in local communities. And can I conclude by uh, wishing uh, uh, Musselboro Monarchs uh, well, unless of course they are in direct competition with the uh, common old Centurions. Uh, Thank you. I have a supplementary from Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much indeed. Does the Scottish Government consider that participants in sports involving air rifles, such as the tetrathlon, should not face administrative objects, objectives to, in training and competing? Minister. Well, uh, of course, the uh, Scottish Government, through Sports Scotland, does uh, a supporter of uh, the sport of shooting uh, through, uh, the, uh, through Sports Scotland. Uh, and, of course, shooting is a, a recognised a Commonwealth sport in 2013-14, uh, we invested £150,700, which I think indicates uh, the great support that we place in the sport of shooting. Thank you, Minister. Question 9, Jane Baxter. <clears throat> to ask the Scottish Government what additional accident and emergency data it is considering publishing. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government statisticians started weekly publication of A&E official statistics on the 3rd of March, reporting on the week ending the 22nd of February 2015. Following user consultation of the quarterly A&E publication in the autumn of last year, ISD commenced monthly publication of key A&E statistics in February. ISD is also currently reviewing its publication schedule and timescales with a view to publishing more detailed information about A&E attendances across Scotland following the consultation. The frequency of release has yet to be determined, but a first release will be made late in the summer. This will likely include more about the demographics of people who attend, such as deprivation, gender, ethnicity, the reasons why people may spend more than three hours in departments, and more visualisations, such as the geographical mapping of A&E attendances. Additionally, ISD is reviewing what information can be published to demonstrate how patients move through unscheduled care services. Jane Baxter. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Just as the Scottish Government has been forced to publish the weekly accident and emergency data, when will the Cabinet Secretary start to publish the weekly returns from NHS boards on both boarding out and delayed discharges? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, I think, as I've said in this chamber before, um, statisticians have been looking at how much information and what information can be uh, put onto the site. We want to make as much information available as possible, and that's why they are working through that at the moment to look at how quickly they can. Of course, it's important that that information is accurate and of good quality, and also takes, of course, into account the fact that now delayed discharge is the responsibility, really, of the integrated joint boards, which came to life from the 1st of April onwards, and it's important that any statistical reporting reflects that as well. Many thanks. Question number 10, George Adam. Presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government what recent discussions it has had with the Scottish Medicine Consortium regarding the licensing of new drugs for the treatment of MS. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government has regular discussions with the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Most recently this month, the Scottish Medicines Consortium approved another treatment for MS. As I know the member is aware from his interest in this issue, the SMC has accepted all treatments for MS where they have received a submission from this pharmaceutical company. For the SMC to continue to be able to accept treatments, they need to continue to receive good quality submissions from the pharmaceutical industry with a fair offering on price. Thank you. George Adam. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. and She will be aware that this is MS Awareness Week. And during last year's MS Awareness Week, I actually wrote to one of the drug manufacturing companies regarding a drug called Vampira. This is a drug that can make life-changing decisions position and mobility for many people with MS. Currently, I, after much uh, deliberation backwards and forwards with the company, I am unaware of a timeline that they have set for submitting this drug. Can the Cabinet Secretary or is the Cabinet Secretary in a position to provide me with an update on licence of this particular MS drug? Cabinet Secretary. Uh I would also want to take the opportunity, as George Adam has, to recognise that this is MS uh, Awareness Week and a good opportunity to highlight the, the very good work that is going on, uh, not least through the, the voluntary sector, to support people with, with MS. And I certainly uh, I welcome the cross-party group's attention uh, to uh, the issue that, that George Adam raises and the steps that they have taken. The Scottish Government has also raised the issue of non-submission to uh, the Scottish Medicines Consortium with the pharmaceutical company concerned. I understand that discussions with the SMC are now taking place. However, I would reiterate and encourage the manufacturer to set out a timeline for progressing this sub submission and to share this with the cross-party group. I am happy to, to do what I can uh, to support that and uh, to keep George Adam informed. Thank you. Question number 11, Ian Gray. To ask the Scottish Government whether health spending in Scotland has risen less than in England since 2010. Cabinet Secretary. This Government has met its commitment to increase NHS Scotland's resource budget in real terms every year, and that has seen a 5% real terms increase in the five years to 2015-16. We have passed on resource consequentials in full since 2010-11 and in 2015-16 we went further and invested £54 million above consequentials from English health spend. Scotland's frontline health service budget now stands at an all-time record of more than £12 billion a year and funding is higher per head than in the rest of the UK. In terms of total investment, including capital and non-profit distributing capital investment, the total health investment in Scotland has increased in cash terms by £1.5 billion from 2009-10 to 2015-16. Ian Gray. <clears throat> well, presiding officer, that was a long and convoluted uh, answer to a question to which the honest answer was simply yes. The fact is that since 2010, uh, health spending in Scotland has increased by 1% in real terms, while in England it has increased by 6%. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain to us why she has failed to protect the NHS, even to the degree that the Tories in England have done so? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it, that uh, Labour say one thing in England, which is to say that the Tories underfund the NHS, and then they come here and say how great, how great the Tories are at funding our National Health Service. The truth Order, of the matter please. is, the Order. truth of the matter is that this government has passed on every penny of health resource consequentials and more for 2015-16. The figures that uh, Ian Gray uh, has highlighted, of course, from IFS 
has not included NPD capital expenditure. And of course, that amounts to around £380 million for 2015-16. And indeed, in looking at 2015-16, health resource spending in Scotland will increase by £409 million. As I said in my earlier answer, taking total health spend to over £12 billion for the first time. But let's also be clear, in this election, uh, presiding officer, it's only the SNP that's putting forward a manifesto commitment to see a real terms increase in NHS funding, which would be £2 billion for Scotland's NHS by 2020. That has not been matched by the Labour Party in any means whatsoever. In fact, Labour's proposals are to chronically underfund the NHS going forward, something which I I think the voters are seeing through well and truly. Thank you. Question 12, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle malnutrition. Minister Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is important to note that mal malnutrition can refer to people who are overnourished as well as those who are undernourished. The Scottish Government has spent £7.5 million from 2012 to 15 to encourage healthy eating, especially in our most deprived communities and we will continue to give this area a high priority. In addition to this, the Scottish Government has invested 300,000 in 2014-15 to enable boards to deliver further improvements in nutritional care. I'm hosting a summit on malnutrition on the 20th of May in Edinburgh, and attendees include medical professionals, government and NHS officials, the third sector, community groups, academics, and representatives from the National Nutritional Care Advisory Board, and the Food Commission. The summit will look at what causes malnutrition, the impact on the community, and what action can be taken to prevent it. There will be specific focus on older people, food access, and community health and social care. Thank you. Claire Baker. Uh, the Minister may be aware of reports from the Courier earlier this month on the number of patients being treated for malnutrition in Fife. Um, according to the figures, malnutrition affected some 2,281 patients in 2014, which is an increase on the 2013 figure. Um, it's also Fife's recorded figure is significantly higher than Tayside's recorded figure, the neighbouring board. Um, can I ask, therefore, what action the Scottish Government is willing to take to address malnutrition specifically in Fife, and if um, today she will guarantee to work with NHS Fife to lower the number of patients who are being treated for malnutrition? Minister. Uh, yes, Presiding Officer, I thank uh, Claire Baker for her uh, supplementary question. Um, I don't know if she's been in, con uh, in contact with NHS, in NHS Fife directly on this, but the reason the figure is so high in Fife is that they've used a more diverse ICD-10 code list than other health boards and have included multiple admissions of patients with uh, malnutrition. Uh, but I'm sure NHS Fife will be engaging with um, the Health Summit, and I'm uh, more than willing to engage with NHS Fife directly on this subject. Thank you. Question number 13, Nanette Milne. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many cases have been reported to ministers of private and confidential information held on patients being lost, left in public places or breached? Cabinet Secretary. In August 2014, the Scottish Government introduced a new approach to categorising incidents and has started to record figures and details on significant information security incidents. One incident has been reported since the new approach was introduced. Nanette Milne. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, helpful response. It, it is, of course, totally unacceptable that private and confidential information uh, is held in patients isn't 100% secure, and we have seen a number of data breaches over the years. Um, what action has been taken to really put the situation right? And with the NHS increasingly moving towards electronic records and information sharing, what provisions are being put in place to safeguard patients' confidential data? Cabinet Secretary. I mean, as Nanette Milne said herself, it is unacceptable when breaches occur. Uh, thankfully, uh, they are, have always been fairly minor in nature, although I can understand um, the, the, the worry that that still uh, generates. But I think it's important to uh, make the distinction between um, those minor incidents where there is no... Uh, a serious concern for, for the patients involved and those major incidents of which I said that there was, there was one. In terms of uh, the work going forward, there is a, a lot of work underway uh, to make sure that uh, the, the opportunity of the, the, the 
that is minimised for any loss of data, whether that is through uh, paper uh, data or indeed electronic data, and that involves um, processes and procedures and training. And I can certainly write to Nanette Milne to update her, certainly on the electronic side of matters as we move more uh, towards having a, a, a more paperless, paperless system. Thank you. Question number 14, Anne McTaggart. Thank you, President Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government how many general practices have been unable to recruit one or more partners for more than six months? Cabinet Secretary. Numbers of vacancies for GP posts are, are not held centrally, as this is a, a matter for individual GP contractors as employers. As part of a move towards better quality, more regular and more consistent information, preparations to conduct a workforce survey later this year are underway, aiming to obtain robust and accurate information on the numbers, gender, age profile, working patterns, contractual status and workload of GPs and other staff working within GP practices in Scotland. I would encourage all practices in Scotland to assist us in ensuring this information is as robust as possible by taking part in the survey. In addition, we also are seeking to profile the GP workforce in terms of how it is placed to deliver high quality services for Scotland's people in future, whether in hours or out of hours. Anne McTaggart. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. But given the closure of practices to new patients and the growing number of practices which are already having difficulty in recruiting and retaking GPs, and now also with the BMA survey showing that many GPs are intending to retire, as many as one in five are considering emigrating, how is this government planning to recruit between 563 and 915 additional GPs by 2020? Well, as I said uh, earlier uh, in my earlier answers around this, this subject, uh, we have seen an increase in the number of GPs. We've seen an increase in uh, the investment over recent years as well, but there is more to be done. There is a, a, a current uh, uh, issue of, of GPs perhaps retiring earlier than they would have due to some changes around the pension contributions, but uh, we absolutely have to look at the model of primary care going forward to make sure that uh, it's not just about GPs themselves, but it's about the wider primary care team. It's about the issues of flexibility that I, we, I responded to in, the, in answer to Nanette Milne. It's about how we make general practice more attractive, because at the moment we have GP training posts that are, we're not able to fill because we're not getting the interest in, uh, from doctors wanting to go into general practice in the way that we need. So, yes, we could expand GP training numbers, but if we've got difficulty filling the ones we have at the moment, then there is a wider issue going on about how attractive general practice is. We have to address that. We have to make it a more uh, flexible uh, profession to enter into, and that will be partly through um, not just the, ind the independent contractor-based uh, practices, but also the use of salaried GPs uh, where appropriate. But I'm happy to keep Anne McTaggart um, up to date on some of these discussions as we take them forward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Question number 15, Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will review its A Place to be Smoke Free campaign. Minister Maureen <coughs> Watt. A Place to be Smoke Free is an NHS Five campaign to support the implementation of its smoke-free grounds policy. This has been accompanied by new smoke-free signage across the NHS Fife estate. NHS Fife is monitoring compliance with its smoke-free policy on an ongoing basis. Initial observations are that, are that there has been a reduction in smoking and in tobacco-related litter across NHS Fife grounds. Tobacco is the biggest cause of preventable ill health and early death in Scotland. This government is committed to tackling that, and I welcome the efforts of all NHS boards, including NHS Fife and NHS Scotland, in implementing and supporting smoke-free policies. This may be difficult for some smokers, but this is a positive response to, to complaints about smoking on NHS grounds from staff, patients and visitors. I also thank all those patients, visitors and staff for their efforts to respect these. Roger Campbell. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer, but uh, she may be aware of a number of reports circulating in the press, uh, including the Courier on the 20th of April, suggesting substantial numbers of uh, people are flaunting the ban. Can the Minister advise whether the Scottish Government is considering introducing a ban in the Public Health Bill? Minister. I 
thank Roger Campbell for his supplementary. I still think it's early days uh, in the new policy of smoke-free NHS grounds. And this is, approach is not about enforcement, but about raising awareness and changing culture. However, I recognise that chief executives are concerned about compliance, and we recently consulted on a range of legislative proposals relating to, back, to tobacco and e-cigarettes, including what action, if any, the Scottish Government should take to support NHS smoke-free grounds. And I will announce our response to that consultation shortly. If the question and answer is very brief, I call question 16, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed football club funding with PSKIB, ITV and BBC. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The First Minister sent a letter to Tony Hall, Director General of the BBC, on the 2nd of April 2015, asking about the disparity between the BBC's investment in English and Scottish football. We have not raised the issue with any other broadcasters yet, but intend to do so. Richard Lyle. Reports that many individual football clubs in England will receive an average of yearly payment of over 100 million or more in regard to football funding from television companies. Would the Minister agree with me that UK sports channels should look to improve their payment allocation made to SFA and Scottish football clubs in general? Minister. Uh, yes, indeed. The First Minister received a response uh, from Tony Hall stating the BBC does not control the sports rights market and they have to consider value for money for the licence fee pair. Whilst I accept the need for them to consider value for money. I also hope they can understand the concern that exists about the disparity in their investment in English football as opposed to Scottish football. I don't want to exaggerate the extent that the Scottish Government can influence these matters, officer, but we stand ready to assist the SFA and the SPFL in this matter if we can. Many thanks, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. And we now turn to the next item of business. I'll allow a few moments for members to change positions.